what the Bible teaches about worship. Now, I want us to understand worship in two forms, in a broad sense and in a narrow sense. Worship in a broad sense and in a narrow sense. Worship in the broad sense is more than just what happens on a Sunday morning. In fact, Christian worship is everything that a Christian does throughout his life. It comprises all that the Christian does. I want to read us from the Westminster Confession or the Baptist Keechers Catechism. The first question that is asked is, what is the chief and highest end of man? I'm sure many of you have heard this. Man's chief and highest end is to glorify God and to fully enjoy him forever. Now, the framers of this catechism just didn't invent something and thought that was a good idea. But rather, they got this idea from the word of God itself. And some of what I'm speaking to you has been uh, uh, slightly dipped in by Dion and Brother Benoit also kind of spoke about it slightly. And where do they get this idea of worship? So you see 1 Corinthians 6, verse 20. For you were bought with a prize, therefore glorify God in your spirit, which is God's. And so this glorifying of God, God is spiritual worship. This is the broader sense of what we see as worship. Again, 1 Corinthians 10, verse 31 whether therefore you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all for the glory of God. Again, all that we do is for the glory of God. That is spiritual worship. Philippians 4.4, 4, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. And two more verses, Psalms 144, verses 15. Happy is that people that is in such a case. Happy is that people whose God is the Lord. So happiness in enjoying God is Christian worship. Ecclesiastes 3, verses 12 to 13. I perceive that there is nothing better for them than to eat, be joyful, and do good as long as they live. As that everyone should eat and drink and take pleasure in all his toil, this is God's gift to man. So even when you work, when you live your life, all of that is Christian worship unto God. This is God's gift to us. So in other words, when we enjoy our Christian life in the larger sense, all of that is God's gift to us, and enjoying it is our spiritual worship. So that's a broad sense of what we mean by worship. So that to glory God and to enjoy him forever, this begins in the time we become Christians and goes all the way till eternity. And so that is the broader sense of Christian worship. This must be the goal of every Christian. This is not only for some people, but this is the goal of all who are Christians. And Brother Charles spoke to us what a Christian's life should look like. And so this is the broader sense of Christian worship. Now, since our brothers have already spoken to us about the broader sense of Christian worship, what we're going to focus now is on the narrow sense of worship. In other words, uh, Brother Benoit told us what is a church. And so we look at when the church gathers for corporate worship on the Lord's Day, what does the church do? How do they worship? And that is what we're going to look at today. We're not going to look at the broader sense. Our brothers have already taught us that. And we're looking at the narrow sense. We've already seen that the church gathered regularly to worship God. Again, Brother Benoit beautifully showed that to us from Hebrews chapter 10, verses 25. Let us not neglect the meeting together, as some of you have made a habit, but as let us encourage one another, and all the more as you do as the day approaches. So we know that we have to do it regularly, as often as we meet on the Lord's day. So biblical worship is all that a Christian does together on the Lord's Day, on a Sunday. This is what we're looking at. God has informed us in his word how we are to worship when we gather together. So we don't need to think, okay, so when we gather, what do we do now? What will appeal to people? 
because the word of God has told us. Brother Dion explained to us the sufficiency of scripture. So scripture is sufficient that in, in, the, in as much as that it's told us what we are to do when we gather together. Now the church is dispersed through the week. They're not always gathered, right? The church is dispersed through the week, just like our family. Everyone goes to work. They're not always at work. Everyone is not there. And then you gather together for a meal, maybe dinner. If you're in Mumbai sometime, uh, dinner happens at 11 in the night, or sometimes only two pe people are there in the house. And some people are working in the night, some people are working in the daytime. I don't know how Kochi is, but I know that you're like catching up. But uh, that is how it is. But you are together, and then you're dispersed, and then you come back together. So we're looking at corporate worship, so how the church, when it unites together on the Lord's Day, what they do together. So the first thing we already saw that we are not to neglect that bringing together, being together uh, as a church. So when the church gathers on the Lord's Day, the church should always have God as its focus. And I think the text is, uh, the brothers have beautifully told us what we are to do uh, and that God is our primary focus. So if worship is all about God, then can we worship him how we want to worship him? So oftentimes people ask, what should we do when we worship? What will appeal or what will bring in the crowd? Or what will help others uh, hear it better? Or what will encourage others better? But we need to begin with God as the center. What does the word of God tell us? And how do we worship God as the word of God has told us? Now, some of us look at this and they think that this is like putting God in a box, right? Too many rules. Worship won't be fun. It's putting God in a box. Now, I don't know how much cricket is followed here, but most in India, cricket is followed. But some of you may love football because we're in the south and in Kerala. But in all these games, there is a rule. So for example, in cricket, currently the law book of cricket has 42 rules. And for you to play cricket, you have to abide by the rules. If you don't abide by the rules, you're not playing cricket. Now just imagine a person wants to take one run, and instead of running on the opposite ends, they run all across like baseball, all around. That's not cricket. You're going to have a disaster. Or, for example, someone wants to cheat. The game is not fun. The game is fun when it is played according to the rule. No one says, oh, man, this game is put in a box. It's not fun. Right? We do that in all that we do. In how we work, in every way, we have a structure, and we follow that structure. Therefore, God, in his word, has told us, how our worship has to be regulated, how the word of God tells us to worship when we gather together as well. Very similar to that. It is not like putting God in a box. It's actually beautiful when we worship the way God has told us to worship. And so corporate worship is likewise a regulative, regulated activity. Now, Scripture commands believers to gather regularly and so the pastor must decide Sunday after Sunday what their members will do when they meet on the Lord's Day. And God, by his word that governs us, tells the local church what we are to do. And so since the scripture tells us or regulates what we have to do, uh, what I want to use as a phrase is that bring us to this understanding of corporate worship known as the regulative principle. And in simple, what it just means is that the word of God regulates how we worship. Okay, so in case you forget the word, that's okay. So, in other words, we don't need to figure out, okay, let's, what, let's see what to do. Oftentimes, if you come from a church growth background or you come from uh, a different background uh, than which most of you are here, I come from a very charismatic background. I grew up, and uh, oftentimes when we thought of worship, we thought of what would appeal to the crowd. That was our main thought as we came into worship. 
But here, this is liberating because we don't, we don't have to think what will appeal to the crowd because we know that the word of God will appeal to his people as we've been hearing. And his people will hunger and long for his word. And so if we have his word at the center, his word would work upon the hearts of the people. And so that is regulative principle. In a nutshell, it is using scripture to regulate our worship. Now there's a, uh, if I want a little more, explain it. A scripture is given as all the guidelines that we need to do for worship, and therefore we stick to the guidelines. We don't go outside of the guidelines. That is regulator principle. Just like I use the example of cricket, maybe some of you, if you follow football or something else, you can follow that. Sisters, if you all uh, don't understand sports, even cooking, right? There is a recipe that you follow. If you put too much sugar into your meal, instead of putting salt, that meal is not going to be eaten, right? You can't eat that. So there is a structure in which we follow. Now, Another understanding is the normative principle, and this idea is uh, that if God is not forbidden anything, then we can do it. So basically saying, if God's not told you what to do in the box, therefore we can do it. For example, if God's not told in his word that we can have drama during Sunday worship, so therefore let's have skits and dramas. Uh, and that goes on and on and on, and you can think of different things. In a nutshell, the regulative principle considers the Bible as instructive and sufficient for us for worship. The normative says the Bibles are mere principles. I will follow it as principles, and when there are no more principles, I will add my own principles to it. And I want to persuade us as you all are listening, I don't know uh, from which backgrounds you all come from, but I want to persuade you all to the regulative principle because that holds closer the word of God. Now, let's go to see what the word tells us what we are to do when we gather to worship. The first thing, and I want to bring it into two categories again, we, two broad categories, we draw near to God, and the second one is God draws near to us. When we come to worship on the Lord's day, we draw near to God, and God draws near to us. So the first thing, we draw near to God. How do we draw near to God? The first way is by praying. And 1 Timothy 2, and I think our brother Benoit asked us to go and read what, what this talks about, this whole chapter. But 1 Timothy 2, this is what he says, 1 Timothy 2, verses 1 and 2. First of all, then I urge that supplication, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings, and all who are in high places, that they may lead a peaceful and quiet and godly life in a dignified way. So what do you do when you gather? You pray. There it is. The word of God tells us what a church does in the local gathering when they gather. They pray. How do you pray? Well, the word, God, word of God tells us how to pray as well. Matthew, right? You begin with your prayer. Not on what you want or your desires, but you begin with your prayer towards God, God-focused. Matthew 6, verses 9 to 11. How does Jesus begin? Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as is it in heaven. Now, what, what we are trying to help us see in the regulative principle of worship is to have God at the center of our worship. The other way, when we go by asking what, what would appeal to man, we have not God, but we have man at the center of worship because we're trying to often appease and please man. And that's not what we want to do. We want to see what God wants us to do. And when we do what God wants us to do, we will please Men, and those are men who love God and whose uh, hearts God is changing. And through the word of God, God transforms the heart of people. So the first thing we do is we pray. But what do we pray? We pray the word. The word of God tells us how to pray. Now, I don't know about you, but oftentimes or many times in the past and even now when I've gone through struggles, the book of Psalms is the best prayer book to go to. 
And the psalmist cries out to God in the most happiest moment and the most hardest moment of his life. And so the word of God teaches us how to pray, how to bring our hearts before God. And so therefore, I would encourage us when we gather on the Lord's day to pray the word. So that's the first thing we do. We pray. What, what's the second thing we do? We sing unto God. What do we sing? We don't sing songs that are focused on human feelings, but we sing songs that are God-focused, Christ-centered. Now, if you notice some of the songs that our brothers uh, sang today, this morning, and that they led us into, all of them were God-focused on what Christ has done, right? It was not only about, I love you, and I'm going to do this for you, and I'm going to walk here, and I'm in the water, half leg deep, and all that kind of stuff. But it was what God has done for us, primarily. And so, our singing then should be also be driven by the word of God. That should be our base by what we worship with. So we sing the word. Now, now this is what Paul says to the church in Ephesus, Ephesians chapter 5, verses 18 to 20. Do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody with, to the Lord with all your heart, giving thanks always for everything to God the name of our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Sing to one another. Now, uh, I was speaking to Brother Nathan, and after being in another church, it's, after being here, we are able to see people sit in this pattern, and it's beautiful because you're able to see one another and sing to one another, pray to one another, break the bread with one another. You're able to go through the elements of worship and enjoy it with the saints, with one another. That is beautiful. So that is what we are to do when we gather on the Lord's Day. We are to sing. Sing songs that are God-focused and that glorify Him and that has God at the center. And this is beautiful because if we have God at the center, He, through the Holy Spirit, will transform the hearts of the people. We don't have to wonder, think, how will their hearts be transformed or how can I draw them by any methods? Now, I've ran church for using just methodologies. I don't want to use names, but I've used all the seeker-sensitive uh, driven methods that people have. As long as you use the method, the people are there. The moment you stop the method, the people go away. But with the Word of God, even when dead people are there, the Word of God will bring them to life. That's the beauty of the word of God. And so we pray the word, we sing the word, we pray what Christ has done, we sing what Christ has done. Through all of our, that is breathe the gospel and the hearts of man might be transformed. And then the last one, we give. How do we give? We draw near to God by giving so some of us might think that the time of offering is like a time to chit-chat with people and uh, something that you can just let go. And this is also, and some of us might come from a background where you think if you put 10 rupees here now, in my pocket, 1,000 rupees is going to come. So we come from these different uh, understandings. But that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about giving because of what Christ has done for us. And so even... While giving, the gospel is at the center because of Christ and how he saved me, me, a wretched sinner, and brought me to life and brought me to be a part of his family, to enjoy and worship amongst his people, I give happily and cheerfully to the work of God in the local church and to missions and for other churches. Primarily, we give it through the local church. This is not to make wealth for ourselves, but we give it because of what God has done for us. Paul writes this to the church in Corinth in 2 Corinthians 8, verses 1 to 9. <clears throat> we want you to know, brothers, about the grace of God that has been given among the churches of Macedonia. Now he's telling them about another church. For in severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty 
have overflowed a wealth of generosity on their part. For they have given accord, they've given according to their means, as I can testify, and beyond their means of their own accord, begging as earnestly for the favor of taking part in the relief of the saints. And this is not as we expected, but they gave themselves first to the Lord, and then by the will of God to us. You see that? They gave themselves Cheerful giving happens only when you give yourself first to the Lord. Right giving happens only when we give our first, ourselves first to the Lord. Accordingly, we urge Titus that he had started, so he should complete among you this act of grace. But as you excel in everything, in the faith, in speech, in knowledge, in all earnestness, and in our love for you, see that you also excel in the acts of grace also. I say this not as a command, but to prove by the earnestness of others that your love also is genuine. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Again, see, uh, that's where he's bringing them to the core of why they are to give. You know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for our sake he became poor. So that you by his poverty might become rich. And so I would encourage us when we gather to Pray the word, to sing the word, and to give for the growth of the word. And this is how we draw near to God when we worship on the Lord's day. The second one is how God draws near to us. How does God draw near to us? First, through the preaching of his word. Now, as I grew up, I grew up with two forms of preaching. On one hand, there was a sermon's which were mis mis mispresented and misinterpreted by scriptures. Um, it often focused on the richness of the future that is in eternity and brought it to the now. Many of you will have heard it in the prosperity gospel. And that's what I often heard from my pulpit as I grew up or when I turned on the television. You know, I, at a young age, I had my dad, you had to subscribe to certain channels. You wouldn't get all the channels. I don't know how many of you were in, the, were in that time when you have to pay specifically for getting specific channels. And so I told him particularly to have God TV and some other channels, TBN and all that, so that through that I was getting spiritual insight. And oftentimes what, what I would hear is about uh, how God has blessed us spiritually, financially, and bringing everything about the future in the here and now. And then I would go back to church. And what I would hear in the church is moral rightness. You have to be good because God is good. And you have to be holy because God is holy. If you have to be a better husband, you have to do this, 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 this. If you have to do a better wife, you have to do this, this, this. But here's the main problem. We are all sinners. How do we do it? By only our works. And then you have a bunch of people who... Uh, able to read some of it and think, well, because I'm better, I achieved it. And then you have a bunch of people who are not able to achieve that and think, well, I'm a loser. I can never achieve it, and God never loves me. And so you see these two types of people in the church often. The right preaching of the word brings the gospel at the center. And it is through the gospel people know that they are transformed. It is because of what Christ has done, they find their holiness, not in themselves, and not in the works that to do, but in Christ and in Christ alone. So this is what Paul charges to Timothy in 2 Timothy 4, verses 1 and 2. I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is a judge of the living and the dead, and by his appearance and his kingdom, what to do? Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. Now, some of us think we're preaching the word when we take a passage, but then afterwards, we're away from that passage into everything else. We're not telling what the passage is actually telling us. What Paul is telling to Timothy is preach the word. What will appeal to the people? Preach the word. The word will awaken the hearts of the people. It will help you to reprove, rebuke, and exhort people with complete patience. Why with complete patience? Because the word of God teaches us that we all are sinners. And we're dealing with other sinners who need Christ Jesus. And so when the church gathers together, 
And how God draws to us is through the preaching of the word. And through the preaching of the word, God transforms the heart of his people. The next one is the reading of the word. Now, this is another thing that many people take lightly. In many churches, the word is never read. When I grew up, it was only read if the preacher had taken a passage in his sermon. Most often, the word was never read. The public reading of God's word has power because of the word of God. This is what Paul instructs Timothy again in 1 Timothy 4, verse 13. Until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of scripture, to exhort to exhortation and to teaching. It's clear as day. What are you to do until I come? Devote yourself to public reading of scripture. So reading the word out before the church has power because the word has power and God through the Holy Spirit works upon the heart of people. And so, brothers, if you are in a church and if your pastor is here and you, you do not read your word in your church, I would encourage you to please do it because the word of God instructs us. And God, God's word read is sufficient to work and to teach and to sanctify the heart of a Christian. Now, the third thing how God draws near to us is through the observance of the ordinances. There are two ordinances. That is the Lord's Supper and baptism. That's how God draws near to us. Brother Benoit has beautifully explained how baptism is not a one-person individual uh, event. Similarly, uh, the Lord's Supper is not also an individual event. Now, when I grew up, we would break the bread and drink the wine and We'd close our eyes and sit and pray and then done with it. That's it. It was mostly with me and my God. But when we do it, we do it <clears throat> together with the body of Christ. Look at what Jesus says in Luke. Luke chapter 22, verse 19. Luke chapter 22, verse 19. And he took the bread... And when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So we take the elements, the bread and the wine, we break it. We do it to remember Christ and to remember one another. It's the covenant oath that we enjoy with one another. Uh, I want to read from the Hercules Collins Catechism and what it tells us, uh, us about the Lord's Supper. This is what it says in Lesson 29, Question 81. What does it mean to eat the crucified body of Christ and to drink his poured out blood? It means to accept with a believing heart the entire suffering and death of Christ by believing to receive forgiveness of sins and eternal life. But it means more. Through the Holy Spirit, who lives both in Christ and in us, we are united more and more to Christ's blessed body. And so although he is in heaven and we on earth, we are flesh of his flesh and bone of his bone and forever live on and governed by the spirit as members of our body are by one soul. What does that remind us? Our unity with Christ and our unity in the local church as we break bread. When in baptism, a person is brought into the kingdom of God, united with the church, and with the Lord's Supper, we remember this, how this he's, uh, all of us are brought into the local church, and we enjoy that unity with Christ Jesus. And this is the word displayed to us as we enjoy it. So biblical worship is rightly done when we pray the word, we sing the word, we give for the ministry of the word, we preach the word, we read the word, and we display the word. Now, some of you might be thinking, well, I, I know all this stuff. Or maybe I know that we are to sing, we are to do all these things. What, what I'm just doing is encouraging us to stick to what the word of God tells us and how we are to worship. And this will help us grow in what we are to do. Let us not look outside of the word of God to entertain our people or to be entertained. Now, I just want to, before closing... 
read us from a warning from Deuteronomy and what God tells them. Deuteronomy 12, verse 30. Take care that you be not ensnared to follow them after they have been destroyed before you, and that you do not inquire about their gods, saying, how do these nations serve their gods, that I also may do the same. Now, here in the text, it's talking about pagan gods, and we may not be trying to see, okay, well, how does a Hindu or a Muslim worship that I can copy the same? That's not, that's not what you might be trying to do, but any god, small g, outside of the Bible you're trying to depict is the god of this world. And so what we are to do is the word has instructed us, and we are not to inquire, how did these people or what will draw them better? Let us hold on to the word of God. And praise God that the word of God has clearly revealed to us how we are to worship. And so therefore I would encourage us as we go back Tomorrow, and you worship in your churches, pray the word, sing the word, give for the ministry of the word, read the word, and enjoy the elements in his ordinance and where the word is displayed to us. Well, let's close in prayer.